I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. Today, it's all about politics. We're going to talk about the New York results and a win that made history. But first, we're focusing on what happened nationally. Democrats turned up to vote, and the GOP red wave that was expected to happen didn't. In one of the key Senate races, John Fetterman beat out Dr. Mehmet Oz in Pennsylvania. In Michigan, Hillary Shulton won her House seat, flipping a crucial seat from red to blue. Annie Carney is a congressional correspondent with The New York Times. She's been covering the election, and today she joins us from Washington. Annie, is it fair to say that we and perhaps everyone else exaggerated the proposed projected red tsunami, and yet it's still possible because the final votes aren't counted that we may wind up with one or both houses of Congress in Republican hands. Yeah, I think that this is reminding me a little bit possibly of 2018 when um, the results looked different in the first day after the race, and then it kind of actually looks it might look better for could look better for republicans a day or two out from where we are they're still poised to win control of the house and you know the republicans i've been talking to over the past few days are saying a, a win's a win um you know we, that's a big deal to control the house of representatives it means divided government is back in washington it changes how biden can, can, can run his presidency for the next two years the senate it's up in the air still we don't know who's going to control the senate there's three races outstanding. Uh, Georgia is going to a runoff. It could come down to Georgia again. Um, so we could end up, once all the dust settles, in a place where Republicans control Congress and Biden controls the White House. And that's kind of what we had all been assuming this whole midterm cycle would happen. But the margins are much smaller. Um, there are some themes that that pl got played out across the country that are really interesting to note. One major theme is, you know, this looks like a real moment of possible abandonment of Trump by the Republican Party. We've had those before, and they've never followed through on actually abandoning him. But this is definitely one of those those moments where we're seeing, you know, allies criticizing him for the candidates he elevated. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of dynamics we can dig into. Uh, but it was not a red wave. The smaller majority in the House um, for Congress watchers means Kevin McCarthy's life is going to be absolutely miserable if he becomes the speaker. Um, but overall, you know, it's uh, Republicans are still telling me a victory is a victory. How does uh, this change the dynamic, having a Democratic president with perhaps a mixed Congress or a Republican Congress and a Republican Congress with a Democratic president? Is well, anyone going to get anything done? I mean, no. And, and, and one thing I'm hearing that's even more concerning to people is that if, if it's a narrow majority in the House... That means that Kevin McCarthy, who is still expected to become a speaker, will have to cater to the more extremists in his party, the Freedom Caucus, Marjorie Taylor Greene, people whose votes he needs, and he will have to give them concessions um, to govern. Um, you know, there's going to be, you know, raising the debt ceiling, some real big, important issues they have to get done. Um, does he have the power to, you know, corral these votes to get things done? What does he give them in return? Um, you know, one thing that the White House has been preparing for is these investigations, impeaching Biden, impeaching Merrick Garland, impeaching Mayorkas, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, in the final weeks of the race, McCarthy was toning down that rhetoric because I don't think he thought it was a winning message for uh, candidates in the final weeks of their race saying, I don't see it, that it's there right now about impeaching Biden. But these extremists want it and have promised it to their voters. Uh, will he be dragged in that direction and be unable to stand up to them with a narrow majority? It will be much less governing, much more crazy um, with with just a few uh, seats if they get like 220 or something, which is what some of our predictions are showing. So when President Biden is talking bipartisanship, is anybody listening? Oh, gosh. No, I mean, we'll see. I mean, usually, typically, if the Republicans control of Congress, a president would typically spend those years, you know, doing foreign policy. It's hard to get anything passed. We saw a lot of bipartisan legislation get passed in the final weeks of the of the last session of Congress. Um, but I think that 
with this house that is just bent on jamming him up, um, I don't see a lot of governing actually getting done next year. Can he run against a do-nothing Congress, or is Joe Biden no Harry Truman? Oh, gosh. I, that's a good question. I think that, you, what do you mean, like run his presidential campaign? Yeah. Claiming, do anything? Um, ah, gosh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think that the, the general view of Congress that is by Americans, that it's so broken, and that has been the view for so long, I think this will be another level of dysfunction that we haven't seen before. Um, but running against saying Congress is broken, I think that people already think that and and kind of blame both parties for that kind of government dysfunction. I think he'll be running against Trump. You hinted at this a moment ago, but do the results this week make it any more or less likely that Biden will run for reelection and that Trump will run again two years from now? We saw Biden in his press conference yesterday um, he was asked, what is your message to voters who think you're too old to run again? And he just said, watch me. Um, I think he feels uh, very buoyed by these results. Um, you know, if anything, Democrats overperformed. And, you know, so either we made too much of Biden dragging the party down. Maybe he's not as unpopular as we think he is. Um, Republicans cratered that um, Trump would be his. I, I think I, I do still think Trump will run. And I think that Biden has long believed that he's the only person who can beat him in the party. Uh, but I think that, I mean, the White House officials I talked to over the past few days were thrilled and giddy about the, the election results. So um, if there was, Biden said yesterday also he's in no rush to make a decision. But I think he was leaning towards running before, and I don't see how the results of this election would uh, make you think that would make you reconsider if you were already leaning in that direction. Other than the success of Ron DeSantis, does Trump have anything to lose by running? No. Uh, I mean, I think he still wants to run. I, you know, and I, I just said before, so the, you know, there's been many moments when it looks like, oh, wow. The Republican Party is really throwing in the towel on Trump. This is finally it. We saw it, like, let's work backwards. January 6th, Charlottesville, Access Hollywood tape during the 2016 campaign, his press conference with Putin in Helsinki. These are moments when not just, you know, the critics, but the supporters, his allies in Congress have publicly, you know, criticized him, distanced themselves from him. And look what's happened every time. They've come back. Uh, this is certainly a moment where he's at his lowest in terms of uh, political power. This is one of those low moments. I think it's too soon to say that this is the end of Trump. We've never seen that really play out and stick to him before. So I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't continue with his plans to make this big announcement on November 15th um, and just come back as he you know, thinks he always can. Whatever happened to Kamala Harris? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, where's she been? Oh, I mean, she's, it's fine that you, I mean, she did some campaigning. She campaigned for Ga Kathy Hochul in New York. She's been on the campaign trail. Um, you know, she's not, generally not viewed as a strong player in the Democratic Party or in this administration. I hear only mostly frustration with, um, her as a political force in in democratic politics. How do you weigh the what were believed to be the three major factors in the overall campaign? Abortion as an issue, inflation, crime. Did they balance each other out, or did abortion turn out to be a, a uh, overwhelming uh, trend there? Abortion was a really important dynamic across the country, and I think that we after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last summer, there was a lot of thinking that this was going to change the dynamics of the midterms, and it really mattered to people. And then there was a concern about Democrats as we got further away from that, you know, traumatic moment for many people that the importance of the issue was fading 
and kitchen table issues and your day to day, you know, day to day, you're thinking about filling your tank, you're not thinking about getting an abortion on a daily basis, um, or that, right. Um, people were concerned it would fade, it would get overshadowed. But what the election showed is that Democrats were successful in weaving the abortion message into their broader message that this is a party of extremists that, you know, we're going backwards in terms of rights for women. And it turned out that, you know, what people aren't so ephemeral in their thinking that something that felt like an existential threat to their livelihood in June didn't still matter to them in November. It did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, Democrats actually succeeded in weaving that into their overarching message about what people were voting for. Annie, a quick last question. Anything surprise you in the results? Anything that uh, you weren't expecting? I mean, there's a few races that are shocking. Lauren Boebert is fighting for her life in Colorado. I don't think a lot of people had uh, Lauren Boebert as a vulnerable Democrat. Um, that, and then it's a lot, I was surprised by the kind of broad rejection of election denialism that we saw um, in governor's races, in secretary of state races, um, in, I guess we're waiting on a few Senate races. Where, so it's not, it's not 100%, but overall, I, my, one of my takeaways on Tuesday night was that, you know, running to say that the election was stolen actually not a great message to a general uh, election audience. I mean, it didn't resonate. People rejected the rejectors. And, you know, one actually nice thing is that most of the rejectors, election denialists who lost, conceded graciously. So that was kind of a nice uh, thing to note. Great. Well, thank you for joining us, Annie Carney, congressional correspondent for The New York Times. And coming up next, some local election results and a win that made history in New York. Welcome back to The New York Times Close Up. This week, we saw a historic election in New York. Kathy Hochul beat Lee Zeldin to become the New York's first elected woman governor. Joining me to discuss the election results, New York Times political reporters Nicholas Fandos and Michael Gold. They've been covering the midterm elections from the very beginning. They now have time to catch their breath and assess what the results were. Nicholas, uh, were the Democrats too greedy in uh, mapping reapportionment? How could they have done so badly in New York State in elections that might have cost them the House of Representatives? Yeah, I mean, this was a better than expected night for Democrats across the country. I think it was a worse than expected night or an underperformance for Democrats in New York, particularly on that House map. I think that the, the failed gerrymander is a big piece of that. You know, uh, there are certainly people now that want a Monday morning quarterback and say, had they not tried to flip as many seats, draw such an aggressive map, maybe it wouldn't have been struck down in court as it was and they could have held on to some seats. But, you know, I think that's only one factor in this. Uh, some of the races that they lost, it didn't really matter where the lines were. They lost a district on Long Island that President Biden won two years ago by 14 points. If you're losing by 14 points, like you can move the lines where you want, but that's already theoretically a safe district. So something else was going on, I think, beyond just the maps. And uh, th that's something I think Democrats are going to have to take a pretty cold, hard look at. Uh, and figure out how to course correct before 2024. Michael, you covered the campaign out in the field as well. What else was going on that cost the Democrats those votes? I think one thing that uh, came to mind as I was looking at what was happening uh, during the election night is something that the former governor, Andrew Cuomo, used to talk about. During COVID, he would constantly say, New York is not Pennsylvania, New York is not Mississippi, New York is not Georgia. New York is not any of these places. We had a very specific state politics here. Um, and one of the things I think we saw across the country is that in all these other places where Democrats performed better than expected, they were actually able to run on abortion as a major issue. And we didn't see that play out here in a state where abortion is not contested. We, we know what the laws, we know what the protections are. And so I think the pitches that were being made nationally and locally on crime really affected voters, especially in these suburban districts that Republicans made major gains in. That's very interesting. When you look at the margin of Kathy Hochul, she won by about five percentage points. For a governor running the first time, that's not so unusual. When Mario Cuomo was elected for the first time, when George Pataki was elected for the first time, that's roughly the margin they won by. But one thing that was interesting, I noticed that 
uh, compared to um, four years ago, Lee Zeldin, the Republican, got about 450,000 more votes than the Republican did last time. Kathy Hochul got about 700,000 fewer votes than Andrew Cuomo, the Democrat, did last time. How do we account for that? Well, I, I think, you know, 2018 was the last year that we had a gubernatorial election and the last midterm cycle we had. That was obviously when Trump was in the White House, there was a huge kind of wave of Democratic enthusiasm across the country that year. So Democrats overperformed. We expected going into this year that Republicans would overperform. We didn't know by how much. Um, so I think that Hochul's, you know, I mean, the way that I look at it, I think that Zeldin, frankly, won the campaign and Hochul won the election. Zeldin made this closer than any election we've seen in decades in New York. And the difference, I think, between, you know, the 80s and 90s uh, is that New York has actually lost a huge number of registered Republicans since then. You know, there are now twice as many Democrats as Republicans. Republicans are almost a third party after independence. Um, and so Hochul, you know, had a much bigger pad to work with. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of Democrats out there that think even in this environment, she should have won by 10 points. Mm. And that might have made a difference at the margins in some of these House races if the top of the ticket was performing better. And, Michael, what about uh, the vast number of people who are enrolled as independents or, in effect, not enrolled, and the uh, impact of the Working Families Party, which I'm sure would like to claim credit for some of that margin? Uh, what impact did they play, do you think? I think uh, we are definitely seeing the Working Families Party talk about how they were able to help swing um, progressive voters to uh, Governor Hochul's side. She has not built a reputation as being a big progressive uh, in the way that the Working Families Party thinks of them. Uh, I really do think uh, independents were a major factor in, frankly, in cutting the margin uh, of the governor's victory. I, I think the pitch that Lee Zeldin made throughout the campaign was that he wasn't here to be a Republican governor. He was here to speak to a people who were dissatisfied with the status quo. And the, the margins, especially when you look outside of the city, when you, you look at where he picked up support, suggests that he was able to chip off some people who, especially during the Trump presidency, would have thought of themselves as being more left-minded voters. But he was a congressman who voted not to certify the election of, of uh, Joe Biden. Why didn't that rub off more on him in New York State? You know, that's a question that I think we still have to figure out the answer to. But my sense is from, from the campaign, from hearing him speak, is he was very good at rebuffing that and saying, well, that's not what this is about. I'm here to be the governor of New York. We're focusing on New York issues. Trump isn't in New York right now. In fact, he, he's in Florida, very famously. And he was sort of able to frame this as being an issue about voters' concerns. And he said, if you're concerned about crime and if you're concerned about inflation, you're not concerned about how I voted on January 6th. And the other thing is he tried to reassure people, and we saw him concede the election, that he wasn't here to make a referendum on whether he'd be a democratically elected governor or not. He said, I believe in the voting process here in New York, and ultimately I think that reassured a lot of people. It was interesting that he had to give up his seat in Congress to run. Sean Maloney uh, uh, arguably ran in the wrong district. Do uh, you think any of them are having second thoughts? Yeah, he did not voluntarily give up uh, his seat, though. He right. lost in the end. But yeah, he did maybe choose the wrong place. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's got to be second thoughts the you know day or two after an election. I think maybe not for Zeldin uh, as much. You know, uh, it takes a long time to rise through the ranks of the House, and, and mm -hmm. he's still kind of a backbencher. You know, he's made himself a pretty big Republican name both in New York and nationally, and maybe expanded his realm of opportunities. Maloney was in leadership though, and I think had bigger ambitions. And so for him, it's it's kind of a harder fall. He underperformed. Uh, if, you know, arguably Zeldin didn't win, but he, he overperformed, uh, you know, and I think comes away from this race with a lot of goodwill among Republicans. There won't be another reapportionment till 2030 or after 2030. What about the Republicans who got elected in this cycle? What's going to happen to them two years from now? Well, this is our system, but they've got to immediately start running for reelection because some of these seats, particularly, I think, the one that I mentioned earlier that was so Biden favorable in Nassau County, and the seat that Maloney lost, which is Upper Westchester, Biden plus 10 district, that now is going to be represented by Republican Mike Lawler. Those are going to be some of the top Democratic targets in 2024 right off the bat. And in a presidential year, it's going to be hard for those lawmakers to hold on, the Republicans. So, you know, I think I, I, they'll be interesting to watch how much they try to kind of buck their party and, and toe the center line, or do they say, I'm going to be a one-termer 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to go out in a blaze of conservative glory. I don't know. Michael, uh, did any of the results affect the state legislature? Or the Democrats seem to have super majorities still in both houses. Yeah, they seem to be poised to continue to have their grip on, on the Capitol. I think the thing that will be interesting is to see how the governor's agenda is reshaped by this election. Mm -hmm. uh, Five percent for somebody who's an incumbent, uh, regardless of the fact that she wasn't elected originally, is not exactly a mandate. And I think one of the, the big questions I have going into the next year is what happens with bail reform, which was such a major centerpiece of Republican campaigns. And a lot of the Republicans who are running in midterm elections are going to be in Congress, so they don't really have a say. But I think there was proof that that message really resonated with people. And so I think the question is whether the governor and the legislature feel like they're in a comfortable enough position to continue to resist making the further changes that uh, Republicans and moderate Democrats like the city's mayor have called for. Something of greater concern to uh, the governor, presumably, than the individual legislators, right? I think so. I think there's a real question that she now has four years to figure out what her agenda is going to be. But if she wants to run for re-election, I think a lot of the concerns that affected her campaign are going to be present. She's going to have to figure out how to navigate that. Nick, who's to blame among the Democrats? Howard Wolfson, the Democratic consultant, said arrogance and incompetence. Assuming we take that at face value, who's arrogance and incompetence? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it depends on who you ask. So the, I, I think that the, the left is saying it's the arrogance and incompetence of people like Jay Jacobs, the Democratic Party chairman. Um, they're not saying her name explicitly, but of people like Kathy Hochul, uh, you know, who, who did not put forward a kind of forward-looking agenda of the sort they would have liked to see to, f to actually fire up Democratic voters. The centrists are pointing back and saying, no, we got to do, like, the left is stopping us from doing something on bail, the bail law, and on crime. And until we do that, uh, we're not going to be winning back these voters. I mean, Long Island just, it, just the bottom keeps falling further and further. The Hudson Valley uh, has shown some of that, too. So um, I think they would say it goes that direction, uh, and, and the left says it goes back towards the other. At least Stefanak upstate predicted uh, not just a red tide or a red wave, but a red tsunami. Yeah. Uh, was that ever realistic or was that total exaggeration? I don't know that a red tsunami was necessarily realistic in the state. I mean, if you look at how things break down, the city has a substantial number of districts where their Democrats are just heavily favored. And frankly, Democrat incumbents in the city did so very well. I mean, they had a really good night. Separately, so did Republican incumbents upstate. I do think the thing that we see looking at this election is New York had a red shift that we just didn't see in the rest of the country. And there's going to be a lot of hand-wringing about that from both parties. I think Republicans hope to pick up more seats than they ended up doing, but I, I also think Democrats are going to be really worried about what this might mean for 2024. What will it mean for 2024? You know, I think it's too soon to say. Some of it depends on who's on the ticket, which we aren't necessarily sure about. And these concerns that we have right now about inflation and crime, the question is how those get addressed and whether voters feel happy about current leadership of the state. And I think the difference will be, do some of these, Repub you know, Republicans made real progress on Long Island and Southern Brooklyn and parts of Queens mm -hmm. and the Hudson Valley. Are those, you know, kind of one-off reflect just this election or do those start to get baked in and, and kind of permanently realign the politics in those areas? And that's what I think Democrats probably need to be worried about ahead of 2024. Not that they can't win statewide, but, you know, they, they want to be able to win those House seats, those state Senate seats. You know, some assembly seats got wiped out in the city for Democrats that have been in Democratic incumbents for decades. Thanks to New York Times reporters Nicholas Fandos and Michael Gold for joining us today. And coming up next, my thoughts on Thanksgiving. Think the history of Thanksgiving in America, and you probably conjure up Plymouth, Massachusetts, or Jamestown, Virginia. If you're looking for the holiday's official beginnings, though, the nation's first Thanksgiving was proclaimed right here in New York. But given this week's election results, you might well disagree with that official Thanksgiving proclamation's self-congratulatory message. As in much of our history, foundational myths about the holiday persist. The pilgrims' peaceful coexistence with the indigenous people who so generously relinquished their homeland are, like the Macy's Parade, aspirational caricatures and barely camouflaged commercialism more than they are the incontrovertible durability of Plymouth Rock. 
In 1789, when New York was the nation's first capital, after only a few months, the first Congress importuned President Washington to declare a day of thanksgiving. The thanks was to God, but the founders also claimed their share of credit. Washington's Thanksgiving proclamation expressed gratitude for affording Americans the opportunity to, quote, peaceably establish a form of government for their safety and happiness, especially under the new Constitution recently ratified. Congress's appeal to the president for the proclamation wasn't unanimous. Representative Thomas Tudor Tucker of South Carolina, for one, objected. Why, he asked, should the president direct the people to do what perhaps they have no mind to do? They may not be inclined to return thanks for a constitution until they've experienced that it does, in fact, promote their safety and happiness. Maybe they're dissatisfied with the results already produced. Maybe this year we should give thanks that we've still got the Constitution, and that in the world's most enduring democracy, we can continue debate over a holiday dinner to whom we owe thanks for making us safe and happy. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.